And welcome everyone to uh, Osmo Dev Call tonight. Um, the topic is uh, circuit switch data in GSM, or also called CSD. The uh, uh, yeah, it's it's like sort of half an Osmo Dev Call and half a retro networking talk uh, by today. Um, so, what is uh, CSD all about? Uh, well, as the name implies, it's a circuit switched. Uh, service meaning that there are calls like uh, voice calls um, you dial a number of a destination subscriber a connection is established uh, dedicated radio channels are used and dedicated resources in the um, wired network um, the only difference to a voice call is that there is data um, uh, communicated and not voice um, it resembles the kind of service you would previously have in um, ISDN networks for um, circuits, which uh, well, it's not called CSD there, but it's just called data calls in ISDN, um, or sometimes also unrestricted or um, uh, restricted digital uh, calls. And uh, the same also like uh, analog modem calls in the good old uh, plain old telephony service, the POPS network. So you have basically two subscribers calling each other and uh, there is some equipment in ISDN, a terminal adapter in, in uh, uh, POTS network, an analog modem, and you exchange information uh, between those two subscribers. Um, it is the only data service that is provided by classic uh, 2G GSM networks. Um, so a, a real 2G network doesn't offer anything except SMS and, uh, and circuit switch data. Um, GPRS was only added uh, almost a decade later uh, with the so-called um, 2.5G or uh, GPRS services. So GPRS is packet switch services and CSD is uh, circuit switch services. Um, circuit switch data services in GSM is also used to transport group 4 fax similar service, uh, also known as telefax or fax. Um, it, uh, um, I forgot what I wanted to say, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, how does it look like in detail? What kind of users are there? Uh, how was it used? How was it implemented? That's what the talk uh, tonight is about. Um, so uh, what kind of users or applications were there? Uh, there is uh, the classic use case of using some kind of modem. This is a Siemens uh, um, MC35i modem on the picture there, but there are many other uh, vendors and, and form factors, of course. Um, very popular also, for example, the PCMCIA form factor cards like uh, Nokia GSM data card. Uh, I have one here. I took a picture, but didn't put it in the slide. Um, so with such a modem and a SIM card, uh, you could basically dial into BBSs or some kind of uh, databases or other information systems back in the day um, uh, before everything uh, was running over IP or internet. Um, there was also the possibility to dial into other data networks like uh, X25 networks using uh, gateways, um, like uh, pads, uh, that uh, you dial into from a circuit switch connection and then this gateway is connected to the packet data network or to other networks. Um, of course, also accessing mainframes or uh, whatever uh, whatever is possible or was possible over modem uh, or ISDN data calls, you could then do over GSM, of course, with uh, limitations on the data rate as we will see shortly. And last but not least, uh, you could of course also do a slip or PPP uh, calls over this service resulting in uh, internet or a private IP network access, uh, just like the same in the switched uh, telephony network was possible without any cellular. Um, we then have machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, um, uh, the most, well, maybe not the most well-known, but the most common today probably user of circuit switch data is in the GSMR network, the railway GSM network, um, where the train engine, um, the so-called EDOR, uh, now what was the acronym for? Uh, not sure what the E was, but the DOR is about the data only radio. So that's the way how they call the, the radio, the GSMR uh, mobile station that gets put into the train. 
and that establishes circuit switch data calls to the uh, rail controller, um, rail block controller, RBC or whatever it's called. Um, there also have been uh, the first generations of end-to-end -end encrypted uh, mobile telephones, uh, for example, the original uh, GSMK crypto phones, uh, but also Rode and Schwarz, I think, had some uh, products in this area and some other vendors as well. Um, these uh, phones would not establish a voice call over GSM, but they would establish a circuit switch data call. And then in that data call, they would uh, put uh, voice codec data um, uh, that is encrypted with an end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of some sort. Um, last but not least, uh, at least in theory, there was also a specification for doing teletext over GSM and also for video text over GSM. Um, I'm not sure whether that was ever deployed. Um, technically, it's rather simple and straightforward. Uh, since uh, Teletex is a service that was provided in, in the circuit switch network uh, with a 2400 bit per second synchronous X21 interface. And uh, 2400 bit synchronous is one of the modes of operation for CSD and GSM. Um, so theoretically and technically, it should have been easy to, to uh, interconnect those two, but I'm not aware uh, that this was ever done in, in practice. Um, yeah, and last but not least, there's uh, fax service over CSD. Um, uh, these uh, GSM Telefax devices existed and exist. Uh, this is, I think, the last generation of GSM fax devices you can find, a POSIO Greta device, uh, which you can find uh, is still sold new on eBay, uh, some surplus stock uh, uh, today, um, uh, very frequently, and there are sellers with plenty of, of units. Um, it uh, allowed you to uh, send fax uh, from one uh, GSM subscriber to another GSM subscriber, but also to wired uh, um, fax machines in an ISDN or PSDN network. And I think one of the use cases, at least the intended use cases, was not so much the business traveler um, uh, in uh, the 1990s who wanted to have a fax machine, but more let's say, uh, police and emergency first responders, firefighters, and so on, so that basically even while they're on the road, uh, they could send them some uh, fax with a floor plan or some map or something like that. Uh, um, I'm not sure how much this was used. This is not the kind of uh, user group that I have uh, insight into, but at least that's uh, what it was marketed for um, by the brochures and so on that you can find from the manufacturers. Um, we will look at uh, those uh, different services in more detail, but let's look a, a bit more at the classification of services. Um, uh, in a GSM, uh, everything is services. You have, even though, well, <laughs> a stupid word game, even though it's not a service-based architecture like 5G, for those who uh, know about uh, that uh, terminology, but you have TILA services, you have bearer services, um, and um, Circuit switch data is not just one type of um, call, but there's multiple different ones. You can think of it like a GSM voice calls. There is a full rate, half rate, enhanced full rate, AMR, and even AMR wideband now. So many different codecs. And likewise, for, for circuit switch data, there's many different flavors. Um, the, and those flavors, they span up from multiple dimensions of, of differentiation. One is uh, the synchronous versus asynchronous services. So just like modems in uh, the uh, telephone network, some uh, support synchronous uh, serial interfaces, others support asynchronous interfaces. This depends on what kind of equipment you want to attach. And um, uh, next to this differentiation, there is the question of transparent and non-transparent services, which we will look in uh, separate slides, uh, uh, in uh, like three slides down the road or so. Um, and uh, then these services, uh, transparent or asynchronous or uh, and so on, they are uh, provided in various different bit rates. I think the most common ones are uh, 2.4, 4.8, and 9.6K. Um, there's also lower bit rates and the 14.4 uh, kilobits per second. Um, and this uh, CSD was later extended to something called HSCSD, high speed uh, circuit switch data, which is uh, bundling multiple of those traffic channels, uh, each of them with one of the bit rates uh, indicated in the previous line. 
um, so you can end up with up to uh, 56k of um, data throughput of course at a multiple of the price so um, the csd data calls were already quite expensive and if you do hscsd then you bundle up multiple of them uh, so it becomes quickly uh, rather expensive um, i use this uh, uh, for a short period of time um, uh, back uh, not sure in the early 2000s i guess um, but never really much just to basically play with it, but not really any longer uh, due to the high uh, charges of such calls, of course. Um, and of course, uh, the network also couldn't stay, scale this way. I mean, if you know GSM, the capacity is always rather limited. And if a single subscriber eats not just one, but even multiple time slots uh, all the time, it becomes a problem. And uh, this is then what GPRS solved with the packet switch service where you don't have dedicated uh, time slots allocated to subscribers anymore, but dynamic allocation of uh, individual chunks of, of chunks of time on uh, such time slots um, in, in a more dynamic way. So we, I said we have synchronous and asynchronous services. Um, what does this mean uh, in synchronous service? It means that uh, there is a common clock between receiver and transmitter and the bits are transmitted uh, synchronous to that clock uh, in a normal synchronous interface, one bit per clock cycle. Um, the advantage of such synchronous interfaces is that they don't need start and stop bits. So uh, if you look at the same uh, BPS, so let's say 9,600 BPS, the synchronous interface has a higher user throughput than an asynchronous interface since the asynchronous interface needs additional bits to uh, indicate start and or stop of the frame, at least for the start. Um, simple uh, synchronous interfaces need uh, separate wires for the clock in addition to data. And uh, yeah, I square C or SPI are example um, uh, synchronous interfaces. Um, I think in GSM, at least to my knowledge, modems, uh, GSM data modems with synchronous external interfaces, meaning like an X21 interface, for example, I've never seen or heard of. I mean, they may have existed, but I think it's a super niche use case. Um, nevertheless, um, synchronous services are used in GSM, for example, for the fax transport. Um, and also in other situations, as we will see, um, they're just not exposed uh, necessarily to the user through a synchronous interface. So it's a synchronous in service inside the network, but it's maybe not exposed uh, that way uh, on the user interface. Um, on the other hand, asynchronous interfaces are those that are basically opposite of what we spoke before. Uh, there's no uh, synchronous clock uh, between uh, or the, the bits are not synchronous to, to any clock. Uh, the baud rates just uh, tells you uh, the rate of those bits, but not the phase when and where they occur. And the transmitter can start at any given point in time to transmit a character. And each character is um, uh, started with a start bit and uh, stopped with a stop bit, uh, sometimes also with none or with multiple. Uh, so that's all. Uh, part of the uh, specific configuration and uh, everybody probably has heard of RS232 serial ports, which are a prime example of such asynchronous interfaces. So from the spec, uh, both are possible. So you could imagine one of those uh, Siemens data modems from the earlier slides, uh, not with an, well, it has on the back side, it has a, a DB9 connector with an RS232 port. And you could imagine those also theoretically with a synchronous interface in GSM that would be possible, as that I'm just not aware of, of this having been produced. Um, and then we have the differentiation between uh, transparent and non-transparent services um, in CSD. So a transparent CSD call means that the bit stream is passed uh, end to end. Uh, so of course there is forward error correction on the air interface since the air interface inherently is lossy and, and uh, corrupts uh, data, uh, but there's no retransmission. So uh, if you don't pass uh, the forward error correction, if you have too many errors in your frame, uh, then yeah, there are some bit errors, but uh, there is no data retransmission in, in case of loss. Um, the advantage of the transparent service is that you have a defined latency since your transmission time is, is fixed in a TDMA uh, network. Um, uh, but so you know when the data will arrive, but you don't know whether it has been corrupted or whether there's data loss uh, and uh, the CSD 
doesn't recover from such data loss uh, by itself. So the higher layer protocols need to uh, take that into consideration and, and need to implement whatever reliable transmission scheme. So the, the, there's an explicit relation of those transparent uh, CSD services to ISDN v.110 uh, services. Um, for those who've not heard of v.110, there was a retronet call some months ago, I think in December, where I spoke about uh, these ISDN um, protocols, uh, the VERA uh, protocols, uh, including V110 and how that's structured. And a transparent CSD service in GSM is basically a modified V110 uh, frame. We will look at this uh, shortly. Um, opposed to that is the non-transparent CSD service, which you can only have for asynchronous uh, uh, services. So you have a transparent service for sync and async service and for uh, non-transparent, you can only have asynchronous uh, CSD service. Now, what does it mean? It means there's an additional protocol layer called RLP, the radio link protocol, um, which and, and another yet another protocol inside uh, called L2RCOP, the layer two character oriented protocol, um, uh, which takes care of serializing the, uh, the control lines, uh, such as uh, flow control signaling and, and uh, those uh, status lines of, of uh, serial ports. Um, and the RLP protocol now introduces an HD, well, HDLC, of course, not HLDC, sorry for the typo, um, an HDLC style protocol with a so-called ABM, the asynchronous balanced mode, which is the ITU uh, 1970s ITU language for um, reliable transmission mode with retransmissions and uh, a window and um, so on and acknowledgements. So frames are retransmitted as needed, um, which means you don't know the latency by when it will arrive, but due to the retransmissions you have guaranteed delivery or if the radio channel really is that bad, uh, it will simply disconnect at some point. So either it arrives or the call will be released but it will be retransmitted a number of times. Um, conceptually, it's related. So in the specs, there is an, it's nowhere mentioned, but conceptually, if you look at it, it's related to how ISDN v120 or x75 works. Both of those protocols are also HDLC style uh, protocols um, uh, with a reliable transmission. And both of those, uh, particularly v120, is also specified for um, uh, asynchronous um, uh, transmission of, of uh, serial data streams. Now, uh, if we look at this, uh, this is a diagram from the specs, uh, the so-called uh, models uh, 1B, 2B, and 3B. Um, uh, you see sort of uh, how these different modes are used, uh, or how, how they are conceptually implemented over the various different interfaces. So we always have the so-called R interface, that's the serial part of your modem, if you think of a GSM modem with a serial part. So uh, that's the first uh, dashed line here. Um, we have the, uh, Michaela is asking from which spec, I think it's the 43.010, yeah, 43.010. And, um, uh, so you have, as I said, this, this serial interface here, and then you have the radio, the UM interface here as the next dashed line, and then we have the A interface here on the uh, on, on this line. So the ABIS is not explicitly mentioned here. Um, this just looks at the A, the UM, and the R interface. And if we look at the different services, we have uh, it's a bit small in the slide, uh, but we see there is uh, transparent asynchronous data, transparent synchronous data, and in the end we have the, well, it's not actually, well, yeah, it says, no, well, it's a non-transparent asynchronous case. Uh, they don't mention it in this diagram. So we start with the middle one, that's the transparent synchronous case, because it's the most simple one and others build on that. So what we can see here is that, well, we have some serial data arriving on the R interface, um, and uh, then we have the so-called D and S internal uh, data interface uh, bit streams. The D is the data bits from the characters arriving here, and the S is the status uh, uh, conditions like the RTS, CTS, uh, DSR, DTR, and so on. Those uh, conceptually both go into the RA1 function. The RA1 function generates um, so-called um, modified V.110 frames out of, so a number of characters are aggregated into one RA1 uh, modified V110 frame. 
and that gets passed into the um, convolutional uh, encoder and um, uh, burst interleaving and so on. Uh, gets sent over the radio interface. Then in the base station, we have the opposite uh, function, the convolutional decoder, the, the burst key interleaver, and so on. And it gets handed uh, to this uh, interworking function between RA1 prime and RA1. Um, RA1 prime is the one dealing with uh, the modified V110 frames, and the RA1 is uh, the standardized V110 frames as they occur in the ISDN network. So we basically go from modified V110 frame to standardized V110 frames. And then we go into the RA2 function, rate adaption 2, which then outputs a bit rate uh, of a, a 64 kilobit slot here on the circuit switched interface between the uh, BSS and the, and the um, core network on the GSM side. Um, and then the, the MSC or interworking function could uh, uh, sort of um, untangle these again, but in an in an actual ISDN interworking, you wouldn't have these blocks. So basically, once once you have traversed the BSS and you arrive at this BSS to core network interface here, you have a data call with V110, just like an ISDN data call. There's no difference, and you can trans transparently switch this 64 kilobit time slot to an ISDN subscriber, and the terminal adapter on the ISDN side can interwork with the mobile subscriber. So that's the, the easiest case. Uh, in the asynchronous case, it's basically the same, but we have this additional RA0 function here on top in the data bits, and that is basically doing um, stop bit uh, manipulation, how they call it uh, in the specs. So in an asynchronous interface, uh, you have characters which are uh, characters which are uh, happening at an undetermined rate up to the bit rate of uh, the interface. And in between characters, uh, we, we just insert stop bits here. So uh, from RA1 onwards, everything is happening synchronous to the GSM clock. And RA0 is the async to sync conversion for the user data. Um, so that's the only difference here. Um, ah, yeah, by the way, I said in an ISDN case, you wouldn't have these RA2, RA1, and so on functions here. But theoretically, you could have a modem in the network, uh, it's an interworking function in the network. Uh, so you would take basically the um, synchronous or here the asynchronous characters and stuff them in a V series modem and uh, put them on a plain old telephony network. Uh, so that's the interworking that was envisioned. Um, which I don't think has ever been implemented, but uh, or has ever been deployed in production. I have to be precise. So Actually, it, it has been implemented for real here in the U.S. There has been it, it has worked. I don't know if it still works or not, but it did work at least as of 2016. You could dial a CSD call from GSM to an to an analog PST and POTS modem or another, and and it worked. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, and then we have this case that basically here where the graph ends, you have your modem. Um, it gets its asynchronous or synchronous characters from the left-hand side of this interworking function, and then uh, it goes over the um, over the analog telephony system. Um, the model 3B at the bottom is now the non-transparent service, which is only possible for uh, the asynchronous, as I mentioned. So we have asynchronous characters arriving here. Um, and uh, they get mangled somehow uh, and end up again going through the RA1 prime function to the forward error correction and so on. So if you look at the bottom side of this graph, it's exactly the same as the synchronous uh, case here above. But basically, you have this additional RLP and L L2R COP protocols. Oh, by the way, yeah, which it says can also have optional data compression. So that's true. You can have V42 bis uh, data compression in the L2R COP. Um, so you basically have a synchronous call with an additional protocol stack on top um, that provides an asynchronous service um, uh, with the protocol for retransmissions and reliable uh, delivery of the data. So um, how does it look like in the call control side? It's basically just a uh, normal uh, layer three call control, um, like a voice call. There's nothing really different uh, than an, a normal GSM voice call or a ISDN call. 
The only difference is that we have the bearer capabilities information element, which indicates that it's a circuit switch data call and whether it's transparent or non-transparent at which bit rate and whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. So that's all encoded in the bearer capabilities, which get exchanged during the setup phase. Um, and then everything else is just like a voice call. Um, but like, like in ISDN, as part of the signaling, you know if it's a voice or a data call, um, and this way a, a telephone with a, a GSM telephone with a serial port can know whether to route the call to the uh, speaker and microphone of the phone or to route it as a CSD call to the serial port of the phone. Um, yeah, Max is asking whether there's call hold or redirect with CSD. Uh, not that I'm aware of, but what GSM supports, which also ISDN supports, which is uh, I always found rather funny, is this idea that you change the service during the call. So you can have alternating voice and data services, and then the signaling will tell you, well, now I'm switching in the call between voice and data. And then everything gets reconfigured uh, on, on the mobile station side and on the network side without establishing a new call. I mean, it reminds me at those first modems where you still had a, a, a phone, basically, and you dial the number manually. Uh, and you could talk to the person at the other side and say, oh, yes, now we, uh, we, we put the, the phone or the receiver into the acoustic coupler or we, we switch our modem on and then we switch in this voice call into data mode. So that kind of uh, thing is also represented in GSM. I have no idea how much used, if at all, that was. Um, I always ignore that part uh, because I find it rather esoteric. Um, yeah, so how does it look like on the radio interface? <clears throat> we have um, the uh, various different um, traffic channel modes uh, for TCHF and TCHH, so for half and uh, full rate traffic channels. Um, first, we have a radio interface rate. That's basically the rate of bits uh, that we put into the convolutional encoder or that we get out of the convolutional decoder. And then we have a service rate, which is uh, different to that. Um, which is the, the net user rate. And uh, the addition uh, between the, the difference between those two rates is uh, where uh, the status bits and other things are encoded. Um, so uh, again, the handshaking and, and uh, serial status lines and so on. Uh, each frame then has a certain size of uh, user data bits um, and, uh, oh, sorry, of data bits, uh, information bits, how they call it and different duration. You can see sometimes it's five milliseconds, sometimes 10 milliseconds, sometimes 20 millisecond. 20 millisecond is uh, that what everybody knows from the normal voice calls, where uh, that is um, the standard. We have one voice codec frame every 20 milliseconds. So in CSD, it's half or quarter that time, depending on the mode. And we have various different new and fancy convolutional encoding and uh, um, interleaving schemes. Um, uh, and uh, what I find rather uh, significant is this uh, up to 22 burst interleaving. Um, uh, I can only speculate why they did it, probably uh, to improve resilience against uh, um, short uh, bursts of interference or something like that. So if you spread it over 22 bursts, of course, you have a higher probability that, uh, let's say, uh, whatever, 20, 20 out of those 22 get received nicely, but if you uh, spread it only over four bursts, then if two are missing, then you've lost half of your information and you can't recover anymore at the kind of rates that they use here, or at least most of them. So rate one, one, one third uh, wouldn't uh, survive that. Yeah, this is just uh, the, the relevant specs for that um, in case you want to look at it. Um, I've mostly looked at the full rate uh, services with 2.4, 4.8, and 9.6 kilobits. Now, the 14.4 is always different than anything else. Um, so it's really rather different at every side, uh, at every interface, uh, very different uh, service. So how does it look like on the APIS interface? Um, as you know, I guess, uh, classic ABIS interface is uh, using E1-based interface uh, with uh, 16K subslots for the individual voice calls and so-called TRAO frames or TRAO frames. 
So transcoder and rate adaption unit frames between the VTS and the transcoder and rate adaption unit, the trow, which is co-located either at the BSC or at the MSC, most, most uh, commonly at the BSC. Um, next to the uh, well, it's actually yeah, this is the, the, the trow is what implements the, the voice codex for the voice uh, calls. So in a voice call on the AV side, you have your your AMR, EFR, FR, HR codec, and on the A side of the trow, you have uh, your normal uh, A law, U law, um, ISDN calls. And for CSD, they of course had to introduce new uh, special um, draw frame formats. I guess most of them on 16K subslots. I'm not sure if there are some that require also uh, full um, uh, 64K slots, but I think no, all of the, the, the rates should fit in normal 16K subslots. Um, modern GSM implementations, of course, don't have a channelized or no E1 interface at all anymore. Um, and that then, unfortunately, uh, they never got together and specified and updated the 3GPP specs on a, on a new interoperable format, uh, but every vendor has its own proprietary or sometimes even multiple generations of proprietary encoding for these uh, CSD calls and trial frames. So there is no uh, real standard there um, uh, other than these very old um, E1-based uh, standards. Um, on the A interface, uh, as I mentioned already, it's just like in ISDN. So whether voice calls or whether data calls, you have uh, both of them just look like ISDN um, at that point, and the MSC doesn't have to change any of that, assuming there's an ISDN peer at the other side. There is a link to the uh, retro net call on, on V110 and other ISDN bearer channel protocols uh, in case you're interested in that. Um, so yeah, how do you interwork with ISDN? Uh, the MSC is just a fancy ISDN switch in classic GSM anyway, so call control is just the same. Um, the only difference is that you need to, oh God, too many typos. Um, so unrestricted digital information or restricted digital information gets mapped to whatever CSD uh, bearer capabilities uh, in, in the GSM call control, but that's really it. Um, and uh, the transparent calls end up on, on uh, well, use a slightly modified V110 inside GSM and outside uh, GSM, it's, it's a standardized uh, V110. Um, for the non-transparent services, you need an interworking function uh, that uh, terminates the RLP and l 2 rcop protocol layers because those are GSM specific. And then it acts sort of like a terminal adapter to ISDN. Um, so uh, you you at, at the output of the alt L2 RCOP protocol, you have your asynchronous serial characters and you put them into whatever um, ISDN uh, format, whether it's V110 or V120 or X75 or whatever um, on, on that end. Uh, with POTS modems, well, yeah, um, as we've just been corrected, this has been deployed in practice uh, in, in the literature that I could find. I only found uh, basically, oh, we tried this, but we didn't deploy it uh, later in production. Um, it's the, yeah, the modem banks. And uh, Sam has mentioned in the chat that, no, was it? Uh, Wimpy was it who he mentioned that modems had to be provided for fax anyway. Yes, but uh, the modems for fax are significantly simpler as far as I understand than, well, for those bit rates, maybe, yeah. Not, not for the bit rates in CSD, possibly. Okay, anyway. But yeah, so you have basically modem banks in the network at the interworking function. Um, so how does um, interworking with fax work? Well, it's again slightly different than uh, the other cases that we had before. Um, we use, well, it's actually, yeah, relatively similar to how the non-transparent uh, asynchronous services work. So we have a, a transparent synchronous CSD bearer um, and inside that bearer, we put uh, a new protocol called FA protocol, which is a frame protocol consisting of 64-bit uh, frames. Um, we're almost reaching ATM cell size there, um, such small frames. And uh, the interworking function um, co-located with the MSC terminates that protocol and then implements the, the related V-series modems. Um, the T30 protocol is transparent almost transparently end-to-end -end on top of that. 
Um, uh, so uh, only the group three uh, facts is supported, uh, and the older group one or group two facts, or the modern, more modern group four facts, was not supported. So I find this a very interesting inconsistency in that. Uh, basically, for data services, they use V110, so interworking with ISDN comes for free, but with fax, they use not group 4, which would be the ISDN native fax, but they use group 3 fax uh, uh, from the old telephony system. Uh, it's a rather interesting uh, choice of uh, technologies. So if we look at the same style diagram, we are talking about model 5A now in GSM uh, specification 43.0.10. Again, we have our RA1 FEC, uh, so RA1 prime, RA1 prime to RA1 interworking, RA2 functions, and so on. So the this block here at the bottom is identical, but on top we have this FA protocol with the 64-bit frames, which uh, terminates in the interworking function, and at which uh, whose output we have this T30 uh, um, communication that goes into the modem here on the interworking function, uh, which then uh, transmits it over the analog um, uh, voice uh, uh, network, analog uh, PSTN network. So if you want to play with CSD in 2023, um, public operators, at least here, have uh, phased out CSD recently. Uh, Vodafone already uh, two years ago. Um, Deutsche Telekom has uh, discontinued uh, circuit switch data calls in December last year, actually at 31st December. So uh, just uh, three and a half months ago. Uh, sorry, two and a half months ago. Um, so the only way to really um, do this these days is um, ah okay well the Manaworm states it was extended to the first of March 2023 so uh, just two weeks ago uh, it was dead um, uh, uh, well, it was uh, discontinued for whatever reason uh, I'm not really sure why you would do that it's not that you need any specific additional equipment uh, but well. Um, Probably licensing reasons. You can uh, you can you can uh, pay a few euros less to your equipment provider if you have one less software license to pay for. Um, yeah, so you can uh, use test equipment like uh, such. Uh, this is a Raka six one zero three. They um, have support for uh, circuit switch data services. At least some of them, uh, not all of them. Um, and that's also what I use to do some uh, to generate some test data and to get some air interface captures. And um, the um, uh, yeah, so that the other option is uh, some kind of private network with equipment that has CSD support. In Osmocom, we never really had CSD support in. Um, uh, in, in the code, uh, Tobias uh, Engel uh, did create a uh, Tobias CSD branch in 2012. Um, and uh, in this branch, uh, he added a bit of uh, support on the call control side um, and on the RSL side uh, to uh, make nano BTSs uh, establish CSD calls between two subscribers. Um, however, I think it was using some nano BTS proprietary RTP uh, format um, uh, that is not interoperable with anything else. So it has only worked with nano BTS and I think only transparent or only non transparent. So only part of the CSD services. I played with it once back then, um, but it, it, it definitely worked in some configurations, but only in some. Um, now we currently undergoing a work in progress to have proper CSD support uh, in the Osmocom stack. Um, uh, so uh, what uh, are we working on? Um, our main focus is the 2.4, 4.8, and 9.6 kilobit CSD across the uh, CNI, the cellular network infrastructure projects. That means Osmo BTS, BSC, MSG, uh, and the MGW. Um, for the BTS, we focus on Osmo BTS TRX right now uh, only. Of course, it can be extended later on, but at least initially, that is the target. Um, and uh, then uh, once this is done, we should have CSD to CSD calls between two subscribers uh, for both synchronous, asynchronous, transparent, and non-transparent services. 
and uh, also support with V110 RTP clear mode interworking with SIP using Osmo SIP connector um, and uh, then also get in that into ISDN. Uh, how exactly is yet to be determined, but that's uh, sort of the, the feature set that we are aiming for. And in terms of uh, status, what we have today is we have the convolutional decoder, uh, encoder, deinterleaver, interleaver, and that has been verified against these air interface traces that I captured uh, while uh, using this RACAL test equipment and the Siemens GSM modem. Um, I can give a quick demo of that. Um, also uh, related um, Wireshark dissectors have just been merged mainline, so I wrote some dissectors for the RLP protocol and the L2R COP, um, the layer two relay COP. Um, so, um, policing circuit switch data. Uh, the uh, V110 frame synchronization encoding and decoding is there, and that I verified against normal V110 ISDN calls uh, in the Octoi network. Um, there's also code for translating the GSM modified V110 frames to the normal V110 frames and also synchronizing against those. And this has again been verified against these uh, captures uh, that I took, the interface captures. Um, Osmo MGW has been extended to support uh, RTP clear mode uh, in SDP. Um, uh, Max is asking what Octoi is, is the Osmocom community TDM over IP network, which is a uh, enthusiast ISDN network run over the internet uh, so people around the world can connect to it and uh, interoperate their ISDN equipment now that ISDN doesn't exist anymore in most public networks. Um, so uh, Osmo BSC already has uh, handling on APIS and A interface and I think some patches are still in review but this is also getting rather complete. Um, also, the MGCP signaling towards Osmo MGW and um, Vadim has started the work on the uh, layer one and scheduler uh, in Osmo BTS TRX uh, to integrate the convolutional encoder, decoder, interleaver, de interleaver into the layer one there. So, um, making nice progress. I would say overall, maybe. 40% or so, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, completion. So what's to be done? Well, lots of stuff. Uh, we have issues in Redmine. If you, there's a tag, CSD, if you filter on the Redmine issues on Osmocom org with the CSD tag, you can see all the different tasks and what is already checked off and, and what is still missing. Um, OK. Uh, before I do some quick demo, uh, maybe some time for questions or comments or feedback. Um, we already had some feedback in the chat. I'm going re to repeat that for the recording and for people who watch it later. Um, there was uh, a comment that call forwarding worked with fax teleservice calls and um, also a comment that analog modem calls to CSD also worked on uh, uh, T-Mobile and O2 in Germany in both directions. That's something I didn't know. I always thought it's only the V110 interface to ISDN. But I guess I never tried due to the fact that uh, why if you have ISDN, why would you go with an analog interworking there? So I probably just uh, was uh, a... Uh, I was blind on, on the analog eye. Um, uh, then there was a comment that... Um, uh, the uh, analog modem emulators interworking function is uh, yes, that's what you save, but um, and then that could be a reason for switching off the service. But then on the other hand, um, it's the same devices with the same DSPs that also do all the voice codec translation. Um, so it's just different software in those devices which implements the modems uh, in, in today, right? So uh, it's, I guess it's really just software licenses or something like that, or maybe some uh, yeah, commercial reason. I don't think it's really a, a, a technical reason behind uh, disabling these services. Okay, and um, yeah, typo uh, again. Yes, lots of typos in the slides. Um, maybe I should uh, commit them. Uh, uh, 
uh, earlier and ask uh, people to to review <laughs> and send patches before we actually have the call. Okay, now please, if you have questions or comments, let me know. One feature I would like to implement related to CSD would be a terminal server. Back when I was a student at the university uh, more, quite a long time ago, we had this dial-in terminal server, dial-in box, where you would dial in from an analog modem to a phone number and the modem would be connected to this very very simple terminal server It'd give you a very very simple command line interface pretty much the only thing you could do from it was to tell net to wherever and i think it would be really fun to create a csd equivalent of that so imagine you have a special test number within your osmocom based gsm network to where from a csd capable phone you dial like atd 099 or whatever your magic uh, internal number is, that CSD call would be answered by this process that would terminate the clear mode RTP stream. And then this process uh, would act like a terminal server. It would provide this very simple kind of a CLI within uh, the CSD call back to the calling modem, making it look like an old 1990s university uh, terminal server. And it would allow you to tell net to retro computing servers anywhere on the internet for people who still run like DECVAX or, you know, uh, or what is it, Toad, XKL, or any, any of those kinds of, you know, big retro computing machines out on the internet, connect them to CSD that way. I think that would be fun. So that's my idea of contribution as far as CSD goes. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's actually something we have in the Octoi network for ISDN uh, already. So we have um, a Livingston Portmaster, which is a, a remote access server, which then telnets to various services. So you basically have an ISDN or modem call in our network, uh, and uh, that gets terminated in this Portmaster, and the Portmaster then uh, telnets to some other machine, uh, to some remote uh, process, and uh, we already have this set up for a number of BBSs and, and other services. And once sort of we uh, have the the interface to the GSM CSD, excuse me, um, the interface to the GSM CSD, we can use that since uh, the V one hundred ten calls can just go to the um, to the the port master. Um, there's also a couple of other RAS servers in in a co-location center. Uh, uh, I think the cap total capacity is what nine hundred parallel calls or something absurd like that. We haven't even powered them up at the moment. Uh, uh, since uh, there are no users, uh, so the the single port master with its 30B channels is uh, sufficient for, for for that at the moment. Of course, one can do it without ISDN. It's just since we already have that infrastructure in place, I think that's the first step for for us to integrate with that. And then, of course, if somebody or if you you for example want to completely virtualize this without any ISDN going directly from the clear mode um, to uh, to um, a uh, a CUSE device, for example, a character and user space device um, uh, that uh, might be uh, might certainly be a uh, uh, quicker uh, solution or a less complex solution. So there was a question from Manavum: Which moving parts are needed to have working CSD calls between two mobile devices? What parts do we need to send a fax from a Nokia communicator to a GSM fax? Well, the first question is: Well, um, basically all the bits that I've been mentioning. Um, uh, so uh, the, the the BTS needs to have uh, the CSD uh, convolutional code D interleaver and so on uh, on board. That needs to get converted to um, RTP clear mode. Um, uh, the media gateway needs, uh, and that is in, uh, so the BTS side parts are uh, have started but are working progress. The media gateway side is done, and then the uh, the MSC needs. Um, to support the uh, bearer capabilities and so on, and and uh, use that to signal the right uh, stuff on the um, uh, on the A interface uh, that is not started yet, um, and the BSC needs support again for the bearer capabilities. Uh, so the BSC I think we're fairly complete with the BTS uh, it's work in progress, and with the MSC we haven't started yet. For the MGW it's already done. So once all of these elements are in place, uh, we can have CSD calls between two. Um, terminals and it doesn't really matter what CSD service it is. 
uh, whether it's transparent or non-transparent or facts or synchronous or asynchronous, because whatever the two terminals, uh, the two phones support in this case uh, will be possible. On the network side, it's always just forwarding V110 frames uh, over RTP clear mode between the network elements and the network doesn't really get involved in that. So um, it's uh, all of those services would then work at the same time. Uh, to send a fax from a Nokia communicator to a GSM fax, well, I don't know what the Nokia communicator does, but if it's also just doing fax, so if to the GSM network it's two GSM fax machines talking to each other, then that should work uh, at the same time we can have any kind of CSD cross between two mobile devices. Okay, um, any other questions, comments? So I have a question on the on the Osmo BTS layer one side, I know that you're saying that you're currently working on Osmo BTS TRX, which obviously makes perfect sense why. Now, I wonder with the Sysmo BTS, I know that you've got this DSP5 in there, which right now, as I understand, does not support CSD at all. And obviously you guys are the only people in the world who have the ability to do anything with it. Do you have, I mean, do you guys yourself, you know, have the ability to make improvements to the DSP, or is that something you license from a third party to where even you can make improvements to it? It is the latter case. Um, uh, so we have licensed this. I wouldn't preclude um, the option, since all of this is end of life and discontinued, that we might get our hands on the sources. Um, but uh, even then, of course, we couldn't disclose those. Um, I think it's it's rather unlikely um, to happen. So I think uh, the, the Osmo PTS TRX is, is going to be the first one. And then if uh, at all, what's also rather easy to do uh, is to add the draw frame support for E1-based BTSs because that's a standardized format. And then any Ericsson, Nokia, whatever uh, BTS would also work for the Sysmo BTS. Um, I mean, that's, I, I just don't think there is a... a, a commercial use case that would make sense um, uh, to, to invest all that time um, in, in, in effort in, in, in the extension of the FI um, for those. Yeah, so, yeah. so basically the follow on to that would be, uh, I wonder what would be the alternatives, you know, in other words, for someone who is interested in, um, in CSD on a kind of, you know, semi-hobbyist basis, but also semi-hobbyist, semi-commercial in the sense of trying to run a GSM network that's somewhat production quality, what would be the hardware options to look into possible semi-commercial BTS hardware vendors that run on Osmo BTX TRX, the way CSD would be a possibility? Uh, that's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought about it, but uh, there might be some options. I, I can't really uh, say right here in the call, but uh, let's uh, let's look at that once we have Osmo BTS TRX in place, and then we can, uh, we can look at that. Um, now, before we get further, I, I'd still like to do the demo, and we can have more Q&A afterwards. Um, uh, Vadim is asking a question about IP access nano BTS. Yeah, that's also possible to support. Um, uh, in theory, they should also support um, uh, the, now I'm trying to remember, they have a proprietary, well, they have multiple proprietary formats for CSD, uh, which would be more effort to implement, obviously, but I think in theory, they should also support uh, this RTP clear mode uh, with V110 inside. And if if they did, then it should be rather easy to support them, or it would almost work out of the box, probably, um, if if that's the case. But yeah, I don't well, I don't know about the the, the status of this. Uh, I mean, of course, we've also seen lots of bugs in in nano BTSs during the last decade or so. So I'm not sure how well it's supported, but it should be easy to try at least uh, once this is in place. Okay, now. Uh, um demoing something just give me a second to move around the respective windows um, and start the screen share so let's first have a look at the wireshark dissector and then have a look at how the data was generated or obtained um, 
screen sharing. There we go. Um, yeah, I guess you can see the screen now, the Wireshark. Can you? Can somebody confirm the screen share is working? Yes, okay. Thanks. So what we have here is um, it, it, a trace, a PCAP file that I generated with a tool that's in a branch right now, an Osmo Com BB branch. Um, and uh, this tool decodes the uh, burst indication recording uh, from Osmo Com BB, an A interface recording, and it does all the convolutional decode, de interleaving uh, the RA1 prime to RA1 adaption and, and all that uh, stuff, and the V110 adaption, all of these uh, adaption functions. And in the end, uh, it uh, this is developed for the non-transparent case, so it implements the RLP and in the uh, L2RCOP protocol. So in the initial frames, um, these are all uh, just basically at the beginning of the recording, there's no valid data, so the uh, frame check sequence is uh, wrong. Um, so we have to scroll a bit and I think around frame 480 or so it becomes uh, active the call. Yeah, so now we see some actual um, frames here. So I just defined a new GSM tab format for GSM RLP frames for these non-transparent uh, uh, CSD calls. Uh, we use the RFCAN field, of course, and uplink downlink information. So this capture has both uplink and downlink uh, frames. As you can see here, it's an uplink frame, so we can already colorize that. Um, so we see the uplink and downlink with different colors here. Frame number, all of that is populated like normal. And then we have the actual RLP frame. So here we see it's an S frame, a supervisory frame, an RR frame. Um, with a good frame check sequence and uh, well, the, the usual kind of CRPF bits and so on that all these HDLC type uh, frames have. So if we go a little bit further, no, I thought it's around frame 100, 480, the SABM frame. Well, in any case, um, let's uh, go further. Uh, here we see some actual um, some actual payload that it gets decoded in here. So you see here Apache license version 2.0, January 2004. What I did is in the data call that I established with the GSM modem, I just did a cat of user share common licenses and all the text files in there uh, and uh, catted that to uh, the serial device and that got sent over the circuit switch data call. So now we have chunks of the various licenses starting with the Apache because in uh, alphabetical order, it was the first license here. And we can see we have the, well, this is um, a, why is it an RR frame? There is something wrong in, ah, sorry, no, it's an IS frame. It's a combined I frame with supervisory function RR. This is correct. Um, and uh, inside we have the L2R COP, uh, this uh, layer two character oriented protocol. And inside that we have the actual, um, the actual text chunk. So in this case, version 2.0 January and then it continues with January in the next frame and then so on and this goes on. So you can see the uh, the Apache license scrolling by here um, in, in small chunks of data. Uh, and later on, you will also see uh, the GPL and other licenses. Um, um, but yeah, uh, what do we have here? Covered code, blah, blah, blah. This sounds a bit like a, a Mozilla license indeed. So yeah, uh, that's basically how it looks like in Wireshark for these non-transparent services. And uh, now uh, give me a second so I can... Um, so all the, lib the, the, the V110 and, and the, the convolutional stuff and all that is part of LibOsmoCore Git master. So all that is merged. So there's no need for a branch in, in uh, LibOsmoCore, but in OsmoCom BB, uh, I'm currently using this uh, LaForge CSD decode branch for those experiments. Um, and there is um, host um, layer 23 source misc and there is uh, there is uh, first process.c which is a small main program uh, where you pass the name of a, a burst indication branch recording so i assume you're familiar with the burst indication branch of osmocom which saves raw bursts uh, to a file 
we open this file um, and we also open a GSM tab source, which generates the frames that we've seen in Wireshark. And then we have this function to read and process one burst, which is uh, this function here, which basically um, just decodes the channel number uh, and uh, prints some uh, status, uh, reads the burst into this uh, burst buffer, and uh, then it does the burst unmapping. Uh, for, from hard to soft bits, and then it, uh, it goes into process one unmapped burst, which in turn uh, we have a state structure for these 22 uh, interleaving, uh, frame interleaving, uh, burst interleaving. So we have 22 a buffer that's large enough for 22 uh, bursts. And this burst state exists for burst uplink and burst downlink as a static uh, variable here. Um, we differentiate based on the Arfkin flag, whether that's uplink or downlink, and then we uh, feed that into the uh, D interleaver here, and in the convolutional decoder for this 9,600 BPS uh, CSD call, and at the output we have the RLP frame, which we then feed into um, into the next function, which is up here which decodes a bit uh, what this RLP frame is, uh, USIS frame. This is before I had the Wireshark dissector implemented, so I used this. And in parallel, we also send it to uh, GSM tab, um, so we can feed it into the Wireshark dissector. So if I do this first process here with uh, whatever there is, the, the, the licenses um, burst file, which I also committed into this Git branch. Uh, so people have some, who wants to play with it, have some demo data. Um, if we do something like this, so initially there's all kinds of, uh, where the FCS doesn't match, um, but later on we should also get some uh, decode. Well, this is just, I, Let's try Anything wrong with the IO redirection or one F is the, the padding, so to speak, in the L2R cop. So this is frames that don't have any other content, but I'm trying to see some ASCII output. Ah, there we go. So here we see some otherwise ownership of 50% or more than outstanding shares or whatever. This is a patent clause from a license. So we get some chunks of uh, of patent uh, sort of patent of license text every so often in this decode here as well. Um, uh, so here, yeah, derivative works shall mean any work where then source or object form and so on and so on. So yeah, that's uh, was the proof of concept and from which the uh, once this was all finalized, the stuff has been merged to the Osmo Core and that's what we are now integrating in Osmo BTS. Um, so I just wanted to share show that quickly.